Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, please switch your phone to silent. Um, this session is also being streamed live on U uh, Zoom and YouTube. Uh, since it's a hybrid event, uh, the session will be recorded. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, those joining us virtually can submit questions directly uh, to the moderator via the Q&A function on Zoom. But please keep your questions brief, just because we have a limited amount of time. Um, yeah, and because of the large number of attendees at the seminar, we may not be able to address all the questions. I'll now hand it over to Deshati. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamra. Uh, thank you. I want to welcome all of you. Welcome to the Mithil Institute's um, discussion. Uh, you see the title there. I hope people who are on Zoom, I'm welcoming you also. We're talking about the partition of 1947, the partition of British India, and the forced migration that resulted uh, as a result and consequence of this partition. So I want to say I'm very privileged to be here. It's uh, wonderful to be here with our India team staff and with our partners at, uh, from Harvard Business School IRC in Mumbai who are also here and help, have helped us organize these events. We are doing a series of events based on this book, which let me hold up, and you can see it on the web also, I hope, um, both here in India as well as in Pakistan and uh, in Dubai. Um, and I, I'm also very privileged to be here with these very distinguished panelists. Um, it's my job partly to introduce them, but since they're the main event, I'm going to keep you waiting for a few minutes before I give you the introductions and, and just acknowledge why we're here. Um, it's 75 years since the independence of India and Pakistan. We're still celebrated, celebrating and haunted by what happened. Um, freedom came and it came with a partition. And 75 years later, we're still trying to figure out how could the partition and what followed happen? How could it have happened? What really happened? How did people react to it as they were experiencing it? How did society react to it? And how are we to make sense of it all? So, you know, what's before us is something pretty fundamental. It's it's an event whose ghosts are still with us that still haunt our politics, our culture, our arts, our society. And we're still trying to make sense of it. And that's what we're going to try to do today, I hope in conversation with all of you rather than lecturing to you all. And this all began, I want to acknowledge my colleague Jennifer Leaning, Dr. Jennifer Leaning, who many years ago started looking at the partition, and I'll give you her background in a few minutes. And she brought to the Mithil Institute a set of very interesting questions based on what she was finding. And those questions really helped focus the work uh, that the Institute eventually did with her help into something that really, for the first time, looked at the experience of those seven, eight, nine, ten months of the most intense border crossing, forced border crossing along the newly, the new Punjab border that, remember, was being created as all of this was happening. Uh, when people started moving, they didn't even know. This is going in and out. Are we? Uh, yeah, when people started moving, they didn't even know where the border was going to be. So looking at all of that from the experience of those people and from the humanitarian angle is what we began. But as I said in my questions, this is a very wide, deep thing for us to think about, and that's exactly why we needed partners. And so, you know, Umaji, Navsharanji, about whom I'll also tell you, are among the people who joined us for this deep exploration. And Jennifer brought this, uh, I'm a bit of an imposter here, Jennifer brought this idea to my colleague Mina Hewitt and Tarun Khanna. Neither of them could be here today, but they're the ones who, ex who converted Jennifer's questions with Jennifer's help into an extraordinary project, 
which over many years has borne fruit in this book. Uh, and the work still goes on. And it turned out to be the perfect project for the Mittal Institute. So let me tell you just for a minute about the Mittal Institute. But in case you're wondering about me and how I got to be here, as opposed to Mina Hewitt and Tarun Kanna, uh, just very briefly, I'll tell you, I studied Latin, classical Greek, Sanskrit, Hindi, Urdu. I taught uh, South Asian literature uh, and history. Um, I went on to become a journalist for 20 years. I worked uh, out of the uh, NPR station in Boston, working on a couple of national programs. So it sounds like I have a very wide background, but the truth is I was one of those people who could never focus. <laughs> so uh, I could never focus, but it turned out to be the perfect set of qualifications for working at the Mittal Institute. I'm the new head of it. And the Mittal Institute is a, an open platform institute that does research in anything that seems interesting, and especially research that involves breaking down silos. Academia and society are both similar in that they're silos, and we work to break those down so people can work in concert across those silos. When I think of the kinds of work, you know, just in the last six months, the, the, the range of work that's come across my desk you know, we're a study on labor markets in Karachi. We're developing a large-scale project on climate change and resilience in Bangladesh and across the whole of South Asia. I'm actually looking, you know, we have some of our re uh, resident Mittal Institute scholars here. Uh, I'm seeing Ankur first. Ankur, Ankur, Ankur Tamali uh, Fukan is a, uh, he's a historian. He has an interest in festivals, in populism, in nationalism. He's been tracing Bihu, the national festival of Assam, especially during the turbulent decades of the Northeast's political and social history in the 80s and 90s. We have Ankur, we have Mayanka Ambare. Uh, Mayanka is a demographer. She has a background in economics and sociology. She's looking at, at uh, health care and the elderly and all the issues and the demographic questions that surround it. Uh, soon we'll have uh, Anne Rachel Royson join us. She's studying the early translations of the Christian Bible into Marathi uh, and trying to make sense of them. Uh, and I don't want to leave out Shrishti. Shrishti Sethi is here. Shrishti uh, is also working on the partition. She works especially in the field of uh, Borderlands and Migration. She did her uh, PhD at the Tata Institute of Social Studies. Uh, and you should also talk to her. She has extraordinary insights into partition. So that's the range of work that the Mittal Institute does. And coming back to the, to the, to the topic that brings us together today, I want to say that um, What's really important to think about is these things are very hard to talk about. Our societies haven't talked about them enough. But now is a moment when we all seem ready to. And so it's a moment, it's an exciting moment to maybe think about how we finally make a kind of new sense of, of what happened. And that's what we're here for. So with that, let me just introduce our three speakers of the day. Uh, let me start with Uma Ji. Uma Chakravarti um, is a feminist historian. She's a filmmaker. She's an archivist. She has a special interest in oral history. She taught at Miranda House, University of Delhi. She's written widely on Buddhism, the 19th century, gender, caste, and labor. She has an ongoing interest in the history of marginalized groups. Currently, she's working on a book which has a tentative title of the Dying Lineage, The Politics of Reproduction in the Mahabharata. Among her recent works is an edited collection, Thinking Gender, Doing Gender, Pedagogies, Histories, Cultural Practices. Umaji is also a documentary filmmaker. Her films dwell on the lives of unknown women, and they've been screened widely, as you all know, in India and also abroad. Uh, Umaji, welcome. Uh, we also have Naushan Singh. Uh, Naushan Singh is an independent researcher, a writer, an activist. 
Through her, published, through her published work, she has made contributions to the understanding of state impunity for mass violence, as well as the understanding of sexual violence against women. Her current work revolves around the agrarian crisis in Punjab and landless Dalits and women. She has managed to combine scholarship with an intense engagement with social justice and human rights. Her work uh, includes the academy, women's movements, and the wide sphere of democratic rights in India. And she works both in English and in Punjabi. Now, Sharanji, it's very, uh, very great, uh, an honor to have you here. Uh, and, and let me uh, tell you about Jennifer Leaning. So when I said to you that Jennifer brought these questions to us, and the questions were riveting, and they were a kind of new insight, and she'll talk about some of this. Uh, it wasn't incidental. It came from a lifelong engagement with those issues. And let me tell you a bit about that life. Jennifer is a senior research fellow at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. She's a retired, she's a retired professor of the practice of health and human rights at Harvard School of Public Health. She's an expert in public health and rights-based responses to humanitarian crisis. And as I said, she spent a long time, nearly 50 years, working at the intersection of war, disaster, atrocities, conflict. She helped, as I said, lead us in this work at the Mittal Institute. And that's resulted in the book that has brought her here together. So Jennifer, may I ask you to start us off today? Thank you so much, Hitesh, for your lovely introduction to um, the people, the institute, um, uh, the three of us. Uh, and uh, it's a privilege to be here at IIC and um, with this group of very interested people. It's a delight to see that some of you are young because this is really the start of a story that needs to become a, a series of inquiries that you take on in your mind, with your families, in terms of how you might um, address the future. I mean, there are many ways to digest the information that we have compiled in this book. Uh, the major theme uh, revolves around the, the years from 1946 to 1948, and then the ripple effects thereafter. Uh, and what we're pivoting from is um, a demographic study that I did with colleagues um, that came out in a, a technical demographic report in 2008 in a um, very well-known journal called Population Studies, but it's well-known primarily to demographers. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it arose from questions that I asked at seminars at Harvard years ago when I was hearing about partition and people were saying it was forced migration, a large number died. It's had enormous effect on um, South Asia. And I asked some erudite people who were leading these seminars and said, has anyone ever done a study exactly of how many people were forced to move at that time and how many people died? And uh, this was Sudhir Anand, a good colleague, an econ economist, um, <clears throat> had worked closely with Amartya Sen. And uh, he said, I don't think so. Let me check. And he came back a couple of days later. We happened to encounter each other in another meeting. And he said, Jennifer, no, I don't think there's ever been that study. And I said, well, maybe, maybe it would be a good idea if I worked on trying to get it done. And he said, good, do that. <laughs> so I. Um, enlisted a very good demographer I knew, knew at the Harvard School of Public Health called Ken Hill, Kenneth Hill, and um, a good statistician, <clears throat> Bill Salter, who used to run the US Census Bureau and was just elegant at modeling and, and um, analysis, a couple of other people. And uh, we did a census um, excavation of British India, and it turned out that it was not that hard to do because the British, um, being meticulous about some things, had set up <clears throat> a uh, census commission for British India, which covered 
the three countries that resulted from partition. And um, they had a high commissioner, and then who was usually British, and then a commissioner below that, who was the usually Indian. And Indian, again, means pan um, a continent. And uh, they started that in the mid 1800s. And so every <clears throat> 10 years, um, in 1931, 1941, 51, 61, 71, you have a, a census of everybody who has entered the population, left the population, um, or migrated out. <clears throat> left the population, the way I find it means they died. Okay. Uh, migrated out is a very big, important variable. And of course, those who were born. Mm. So we looked at the, and they used technical mathematical formulas, and looked at the 1931, 41, 51 censuses of India, and based on what you would expect from the numbers of people and their um, parity age, that, who would be um, reproductive age for women, uh, we looked at 31, 41, 51, and just to be sure we were having the right curve, 61 and 71, just on the western side of British India, the Punjab, because that was the country that experienced the most precipitous change in populations. And we thought we would start there. <clears throat> and what we found was that um, the 51 census would have been informative. But what really made the difference is that the, the commissioners after all of the carnage of 1947-48, were now an Indian and Pakistan commissioners trained under the British. And uh, they met with each other, spoke about this endeavor to really do the 51 census. They agreed to use the same protocols, the same matched lots, the ways that they had done it before, so there would be continuity. But they agreed on one other thing that was most important, which was to ask this question in the 51 census to everybody, male, female, um, any age they, that could count to get an answer from, where were you in 1947? They asked this in the 51 census. Um, then the basis of indirect estimation, birth rates, death rates, et cetera, they calculated who should be present in 1951. And they found that there were about 3 million missing, 3 million between 2.8 and 3.2. <clears throat> and they looked at all out-migration options. They looked at the impact of World War II because there were over a million <clears throat> Indians in the British Army. They looked at uh, migration patterns to see if there were people who might have gone out and worked somewhere outside of the Punjab and were not there in 1951. That didn't pan out. Uh, and the end result, these are very wise people, you know, analysts. They said they're not there. They're missing, <clears throat> and perhaps dead, probably dead. Uh, and we also found that about 18 million people had crossed the border, Punjab border alone, going from what is now Pakistan into India, or vice versa, India into what is now Pakistan. Uh, and I've had a lot of experience working in wars and forced migration. I've done human rights and humanitarian assessments of the populations that are uh, affected by these crises and forced to move. <clears throat> and I um, study these episodes over the last 40, 50 years, um, even in places where I haven't been. I'm moderately familiar with what, what has occurred. And I know that there uh, has not yet been a forced migration on the order of 18 million people. And that includes Ukraine and Syria, which are the most recent ones. Nowhere near that. And there has not yet been a death rate of that magnitude for any of these episodes of forced migration. Because if you think you've got 18 million, million people and 3 million dead, that's an astonishing fraction that are dead. And, and you don't see that um, unless there has been outright and consistent high violence. Okay, so um, that then emboldened me to look at the re records, and we looked at um, I looked at the British records, and, and the look at the re records, and we looked at um, I looked at the British records, and, and the number I mean looked at a number of records. Let's see that at that, <clears throat> and there are files that talk about what was going on, 
And at that point, I realized that to really engage in what was going on in the Punjab, I needed to enlist people who were from the region, who were scholars and demographers and historians and social scientists who understood what India and Pakistan, at least on the Punjab side, um, really uh, consisted of and what patterns and expectations one should have from 1947, 46, 47, 48. <clears throat> so this is where the Mithal Institute came in. I got enormous help uh, in um, funding, in identifying authors, in reaching out to them. And together we had a large number of online consultations, the authors in this book. <clears throat> we met once at Radcliffe at Harvard um, for a two-day seminar, uh, Pakistanis and, and um, Indians together and people from Bangladesh. And we discussed, we discussed really hard, what are your findings? How do they fit with what you know? What, is this consistent with what the history has been? What, what is really new here? And um, we found many things that were new. And so that is what's in this book. <clears throat> and there are essays from um, 21, 23 people. And uh, I should know, I haven't counted. Um, <laughs> and um, we have, so it's this book, OK? It's published by Sage India. It should be available uh, because it's a Sage India publication. And uh, it has, let me just look for a second. I should have this answer. Do we know how many people, chapters there are? <clears throat> uh, so there's. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's organized by chapter. You, yeah, you, you do the math. But in any case, a large number of people. And because um, there's some multiple authors. <clears throat> and so um, today, we are bringing together a, uh, a wonderful um, selection of two, but they, they have d very different approaches, who are going to talk about um, their chapter and what they found and reflect on, on this uh, tremendous episode of migration and death, forced migration, which is a particular kind of migration, right? It's not voluntary. And um, <clears throat> could I just say, in the British records that I found in many libraries in the States, in, in Britain, and elsewhere here in the subcontinent, um, looking at, at records in Pakistan and India, um, there's enormous material that has not been looked at. Great number of libraries that have manuscripts that are in disrepair. So this is a story that is just being scratched now. And that's why I'm so glad to see young people who might be interested in going into the libraries, into the family records, and beginning to pursue their own stories of, of their background. Because everyone in this room who comes from the subcontinent has been affected by partition. I say that without you know, assuming this is in northern India, but I'm assuming that that's the, the profile of people in this book. <clears throat> that there are sort of three main points. The British knew they had to get out after World War II because the country, Great Britain, had been pretty much pauperized by the war. Uh, economy blown apart, the Navy all over the world, <clears throat> soldiers coming back and there was no housing. <clears throat> Everything was being rationed. They knew that, therefore, uh, British India was too expensive to maintain. And the new government, the Labour government, that came in at the end of the war under Clement Attlee, um, had told the United States and Russia, you know, the three big allies in World War II, that they were going to get rid of their colonies. Okay, the United Nations, you couldn't have such a large colony. It was, didn't look right. And they couldn't afford it. So they knew they were getting out of India after World War II. And the third is that the British Raj, the administration, uh, was quite thin in terms of the number of people, British that were ruling India. And uh, they turned out to be most concerned about getting the Europeans out before there was too much violence that made it difficult to get out. And they also knew that it was going to be very difficult to get um, Nehru and Jinnah and, to some extent, Gandhi involved in agreeing about what was going to be. They knew, going into this, that it was a huge hassle that hadn't been resolved, briefly. And still, they chose to get out. And still, they, in November of 1946, decided they were going to get out by 1948. And then it turned out in March, deliberations, they decided there's no way we can push it that late. We've got to have 
um, Lord Mountbatten, the last viceroy, with his new orders coming to India, to Delhi, we have to tell him that it's got to be 1947. Um, and uh, Mountbatten determined after he couldn't get Jinnah and Nehru to agree to a certain um, timetable, um, he said, it's August of 1947. He made that announcement um, to the public of India in June via a radio address. Imagine a radio going to everybody in India. Most people had no idea what he was talking about. Um, he said, <clears throat> the British are leaving and it's going to be independent um, and we're leaving on August uh, 1947. And that left a very short number of months. And a lot of people in both the Pakistan and Indian bureaucracies, that is the Indians, worked very hard for continuity and to figure out a pathway. <clears throat> but it turned out that there was a sense of impending a resolution about how India was going to be together or be divided. And it was that irresolution that spawned fear and then attacks that were on a communal level. Uh, and they'd been begun in March, um, and uh, it accelerated. And what you see is a pot boiling over and being uncontrollable in terms of human dynamics. And it was these dynamics that led to fear and flight and um, death. And we can talk more about it. So the, in that context, um, we're going to hear from um, Navshran, right? Navshran is going to be talking about um, something that has long intrigued her, and it fits her background in working with women and with people in rural India. And uh, this is her story, what she found. Right. Thank you, Jennifer. It, it's fascinating. We've heard you before talking about the journey of the project, but it's always fascinating to um, see how it um, came about. And um, um, so um, this, this was the uh, actually Jennifer, when she started talking about where she's coming from into the study of partition, that's what interested uh, Uma, and Uma brought me into the work. And I had known Jennifer, actually, well, we've never got a chance to tell you that from my work on um, um, human rights violations and mass scale violence and um, crisis, um, and also the question of uh, deciding reparations, rehabilitations, etc. But that's a separate story. Uh, so um, I was also I became part of this work and I'm really delighted that I did uh, because this is looking at partition from a new location with a new lens and that's what was fascinating me and for a, a person like me a researcher uh, somebody who grew up in Punjab in Amritsar uh, my own family um, was um, came from West Pakistan. Um, as I was growing up in Amritsar in a joint family, there was not a single day when partition did not come into the discussions over lunches, dinners, and whenever grandma, grandfather sat and they talked about what happened. And also this was the time when um, uh, I mean, this was in the mind always. It never left because my family also faced a lot of violence. They saw the lost members of the family, etc. So, um, my, this whole question, when it opened up with Jennifer and um, also um, the second narrative um, emerging in partition literature, as they say, uh, based on reopening and reinterpretation of archives and giving um, an opportunity to expand um, the story of partition, not only from uh, the lens of high politics, but also bringing in the question of experience of people who were um, um, who, who saw 
um, partition and who experienced it. And also from the second generation who carried the story over. And I'm one person who is um, a carrier of intergenerational story of um, partition. But again, um, um, when I started looking at the question of partition, uh, it became very clear that there are still even when we are talking of um, new narratives entering, there are some uh, silences. There are a uh, large number of um, wounds. There are a large number of uh, exclusions uh, from this history. Um, and they continue to be important, um, but neglected. So uh, this is, um, and one of the people or one of the, the classes um, that I found uh, totally missing was the rural landless um, uh, low caste Muslims uh, in Punjab. And um, I learned um, fairly early that um, their story was never going to be part of any uh, large um, historical records, because whatever I had sifted through did not have any reference to this group uh, and how identity formation also happened in this. So, so this talks of also uh, politics of speech, uh, who gets to speak and uh, who records in what medium. So um, I've been working um, on landless Dalit labor in Punjab for the last many years now. Uh, but my introduction uh, 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 to Muslim landless Dalits actually was accidental when I was reading a prison notebook of a left, uh, a senior left activist who uh, was leading a large um, land to Dalits um, agitation in 2009 uh, in Punjab and was uh, arrested because of that. And uh, then he, when he wrote his prison diary, um, there was a mention of a Muslim kammi um, uh, uh, attached labor, who this uh, uh, person writes, Sukhdarshan Nath is his name, that um, uh, he, how he was rescued, how he became his experience of partition. So uh, it was a fascinating story how um, rural Kammis in that particular region were saved by communists um, at the time of 1947 and were um, rehabilitated in the villages. They were told that this was their land and they should not go. And then this person, who I interviewed uh, later on, said that uh, I thought these were good people, these communists, and I also became a communist. Um, and that's his story. Uh, but, but this research itself was um, uh, quite revealing of the process, actually, that um, that shaped uh, um, Indian Republic and laced as it was uh, with uh, entrenched caste and class inequalities and the process which continued to, um, to shape it as now it's being recast into a Hindu Rashtra with hierarchies of caste, class, uh, gender and religion um, that colonialism did so much to entrench, um, continue to be not to be destabilized. Um, and this is the, um, uh, the journey um, which I took when I started um, uh, collecting testimonies, um, and this lasted um, a period of over two years, um, with the purpose was to build a narrative um, uh, of, um, on what happened to landless um, rural low caste people, uh, because and how did they? Um, found their place um, in partition plan. Um, and Kamis, um, uh, they had no productive resources. They were landless, dependent on landlords for both security and livelihoods. And landlords had complete control over their Kamis. The people I spoke to were all attached labor um, um, 
to Sikh landlords, uh, not Muslim, Sikh landlords, and also some of them were artisans uh, who lived in the village, but also as attached to the local rural community. Uh, while we, uh, I was uh, talking to um, and um, all, all of these people, which began with first with the person who was arrested, um, and then snowballed into other um, uh, people who I interviewed, were it was a difficult process, a very difficult process, because this was 17, 18, 2017, 18, when um, politics of hatred was um, getting entrenched. Uh, there was all around instability. And uh, the people they um, were talking about, a lot of the um, whose testimonies were collected, um, the perpetrators of violence were also around in the same villages or in adjoining villages. So uh, testimonies were fraught. Um, they, they, they didn't want me to record anything. They didn't want me to switch uh, on my tape recorder and became comfortable only when I agreed not to record, but to take, um, they agreed to my taking copious amounts of notes, which I did. Um, and what was revealed was um, an underbelly of deeply divided, caste-ridden, prejudicial, and very gendered um, society uh, that they had inherited. So um, it, it, it was their history of dispossession, of silencing, and betrayal now uh, becoming a larger refrain in which they were describing their journey. And every time uh, they talked uh, about past, uh, present was slinking back into the conversation um, of uh, how they loved, how they stayed because um, of the love of the land and uh, look where they have. And what is homeland for them was a question that was um, uh, they, uh, interestingly when um, many of them said that as um, they started uh, seeing migration, forced migration, exodus, and in Punjab they call it uh, Rale, uh, which is uh, mass violence, uh, Ujada, which is exodus, uh, forced migration, um, Halle. They were uh, talking at the same time on what were they told. They said that they started to leave, and the, the landlords asked, and it came up in many testimonies, uh, where are you going? What will you do in an alien land? Um, and who will do the jobs here if you leave? Um, there were a um, couple of instances where the same sentence was spoken by the um, by this labor. Uh, they were stopped by their landlord and said, who gave you the permission to leave? Who will do the work on the land? And um, they were ordered back. And they decided not to leave. Um, but. Now, when I'm talking to them in 2017, 2018, the land doesn't require more bodies. Um, at that time, they were laboring bodies whose labor was required. And they were being pushed out or retained based on the need for their labor. And now, with um, the background of green revolution, um, mechanization, that same labor is not required um, on the land. And for a, now for a kammi, um, the um, lower caste, um, rural, landless um, agriculture labor, the, uh, the life of peace and also security came with rights which were not citizenship rights, which were not um, guarantees which the Constitution gave them, but the negative guarantee, which they said, um, uh, well, when I asked um, one person, Are you feel, do you feel safe? And they said, yes, in Punjab, we feel safe. But then we never ask for anything. 
of the state. Um, in that same village, I later on found um, out that the small Muslim community which lived there, they had their own mosque. They built it out of their own resources. They were all self-employed, and they all had their own small school. They said, we never ask for anything, and there is no rolla. There's no conflict with anyone, because we guarantee that we are not seeking. So what was this citizenship that they were living now? And there were, um, in the absence um, of all the historical records that I was saying, I actually also relied on Punjabi poetry and fiction, which was, uh, which is a, a wonderful storehouse, actually, of um, what really happened, because we have um, very, um, a large number of uh, poems and um, um, novels written at that time, where uh, Kammi um, is um, a protagonist also. So in that sense, um, this fiction and the testimonies that I was collecting became very important for building a narrative of their inclusion in the partition plan. I'll take two more minutes to just to say um, um, one um, person, Munshi, when um, I asked him, why did you not go to Pakistan. And um, he said, well, I didn't go to Pakistan. Um, we never owned any land. And how could we decide which land is our homeland? Home was where Abba was buried, and that's where I decided to stay. Uh, Post-partition, the landless laborers never received any land, because land uh, which became surplus when uh, Muslim landlords left were reserved for refugees who were coming from the other side, and land was given to them. Kammis were laborers, and there was no compensation for labor um, in the partition plan. And so they remained what they were, landless, poor, marginalized. And in post-partition, they were, of course, um, um, uh, colonial state was forced um, to give land also to tenants and, and to small and marginal jat um, uh, peasants. Uh, who were also dispossessed, but they were not low caste. And they had become important in electoral politics. And with that, they could actually uh, negotiate uh, a deal with the state and get land. But the Kammis remained unrepresented politically. There was no um, a party which was um, um, seeing their interest, and they remained landless. And I wonder sometimes if they were, if they had become part of a narrative of uh, partition at that time and had become a visible group which also was uh, suffered, maybe in the scheme of development or the development project of the Indian nation could have something for them also, but it never happened. So just to um, wind up, um, they were, um, 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 uh, just I was um, uh, will say that a last uh, thing about um, um, the um, there was one um, particular interview with a woman uh, when she started to speak about her experience. Um, uh, she talked about the difficult circumstances and the choice uh, the Kammis were um, making during partition and were also making in India today. So uh, Aisha Bibi name changed, was her name. Um, when she got the opportunity to talk, she, she was, uh, di the dialogue was between past and present um, of choosing to stay in this side of the border because of the love of this land and uh, the anxiety of the unknowing uh, other place where uh, they would go and life not being easy on the other side. And now, um, the unmaking of the idea of um, uh, the country they had uh, chosen as their own 
kept getting back to her and she kept saying, well, I don't have any uh, employment, any job now because women were made, uh, women went out of agriculture labor with the Green Revolution and they never returned. A story which we heard at the borders of um, Delhi when farmers were sitting here, how women were marginalized um, in this Green Revolution. But she kept saying that my grandchildren don't have a job. And then she said, none of the people from our community are DCs and professors like you. Um, Nobody is a professor in our community. Um, and so at the time of partition, it was not their Muslim identity. It was their labor, which um, was the deciding factor whether they will be kept or retained or they will be pushed to the other side. But now, 75, 70 years later, it was their Muslim identity. Uh, labor has already become redundant if they did not uh, uh, build different skills through education, etc. cetera. Um, uh, again, we, even with education, they did not, uh, they were, hardly any employment, and if they were Muslims, there was no employment. But uh, now, uh, their Muslim identity, which became um, important, um, and that's where the story of, the present story of the betrayal, uh, which came up, and I'll stop at that, thanks. Thank you, Navsharanji. Umaji? You are speaking You too, yes. <laughs> So I got involved with the. Uh, I, uh, I won't go into uh, detail, but I got involved with the pro uh, with um, uh, first the archiving project uh, because um, by chance. Um, Jennifer and I know uh, a certain gentleman who uh, decided that she should contact me when she comes <laughs> into India, and that's how we got to know each other, and uh, that's how we started off. And we initially it was entirely uh, an archiving project. Uh, I'm sure uh, Jennifer knew she was uh, the archive had to move in the direction of a certain kind of set of questions, which we knew, which I also knew, but for the rest. Um, it went like that, and but at some point, then the question of expanding the idea of the archive itself came up um, uh, from the uh, archive in the um, in the formal archives in the formal repositories to perhaps being able to expand it to include oral interviews, and that's what I decided to do in my um, yeah, for my paper. Now, one of the questions. Uh, that you might say is another book on partition. You know, do we really need it? Uh, there's so much that's been written on the partition, which is both yes and no. I mean, yes, a lot has been written on the partition. New lines of inquiry have opened up and so on. But in a sense, I think the questions have basically been around, uh, around the failure at that point of time of the uh, leaders to arrive upon a resolution which would not lead to a partition in the first place, and then to move uh, moving on from there to the fact that was the um, was the violence anticipated? Could it have been predicted? And uh, why you know why did it happen at all? Uh, I think Jennifer deals with that quite effectively in her um, in her paper in in this volume. And the volume itself, let me, uh, as it's emerged, is interesting because uh, while it has at the backdrop uh, perhaps standard questions that you can ask of the partition, it also has actually opened up uh, other ways of both collecting an archive as well as, um, as, well as um, uh, you know, taking the partition from uh, leadership and its failure to actually what was experienced by people on the ground. And so to that extent, you know, the, um, uh, and that's a process that we've all, uh, as historians, we know, uh, is that 
after a point, you know, the top-down history doesn't make sense to us because we actually have to see what happens to human beings in the process of the history that we unfold upon them or the decisions that we take, take uh, for them. So in that sense, I think the, uh, the, even the um, way this book has come into being and the kinds of work that finally fan, fanned out um, actually resulted in very interesting ways in which uh, the archive was expanded. So for instance, uh, one of the things I was looking for is those young women and men, some of them, who were who uh, collected uh, uh, narratives. Uh, they had a standard questionnaire, um, and it, I wouldn't have thought necessarily that we were going to get anything rich out of it, but there was. Because in the little bit of the description that you could get, uh, you actually you, know, you got a lot of material, lines of transit, where they went, how they landed, what happened to them, and so on. But there was also experiential stuff. And uh, uh, it, I, it, that's literally a paragraph, literally, literally a condensed paragraph, but it was very rich in terms of the experience. So in a sense, I think this, uh, this uh, volume has got a number of interesting openings. And one can actually uh, certainly uh, push them in a certain direction. One of the other nice things about this volume is that it has, it not, it's not really talking about the history of, um, history as it is uh, works uh, or has impacted human beings, but it's also looked, uh, it, that's a couple of interesting essays on the way it has impacted buildings. And that's one of the nicest uh, papers over here, Nadra Khan's account of what happens to two buildings in Amritsar, I'm uh, sorry, in, uh, in Lahore, and what, you know, its own history. So that's actually quite fascinating, because in a sense, partition and its consequences worked at so many levels, and so many incredible levels, that it isn't actually quantified only by also even the human experience part of it. So there's really, in that sense, I don't see that actually we can easily close the, um, uh, historical inquiry on the partition because there are many, many um, ways in which we can actually add to our understanding, including the understanding of the kind of failure that there was, kind of, uh, was there a failure of anticipating, of planning, of knowing what was going to happen? And, or was it really something that, you know, in a sense, a catastrophe that emerged? And you actually get quite interesting uh, ways, in even that is, it can be qualified, you know, you can't, you can't have a standard uh, storyline over there. So it's very interesting from all those points of view. Um, now, I have been uh, someone who got interested in um, oral history. Uh, I'm a scholar, really, of early Indian history. I wrote my first uh, work on Buddhism, and it can't be as uh, any longer in terms of time than uh, than that, because I, I go into the 6th century BC, and I often say this, you know, uh, thank God for the long arc of history, because Buddhism and the 6th century BC makes me sane, whereas I live in times which are really crazy. crazy. So, but the fact is that at some point, I, uh, you live in the present, and as you live in the present, you actually get involved with what is happening uh, around you. And 84 was, for me, the moment when I... I knew I had to document, we had to document it, uh, because I knew there would be a status narrative that would come on, and that status narrative was going to, you know, look at, you know, the conspiracy, this, that, or whatever it is, but I was interested in what happened to human beings, um, and the catastrophe was so huge, and I had never forgotten the partition, so for me, 84 was a recall of the partition, and uh, I, I felt that I, I can't be a scholar of only ancient and history. I've got to do this hands-on here and now. And I kept on sort of, you know, come, sort of uh, moaning and groaning and saying, we need to document this. And then one of my students, um, who was only my subsidiary student in, in college, um, uh, said to me, so what's the problem? Just get, let's just get hold of a couple of uh, tape recorders and we'll go off and talk, talk to the people. And so we got hold of two couple of uh, tape recorders that transformed me and so we I started to we started to do oral interviews now one of the things that happened in the 84 interviews was many of the six who were um, 
being interviewed by us, uh, recalled partition. There was no way they were going to forget partition, and they had a standard line. They said, nothing happened to us over there. Then we came here, or apne vatan mein hum kumara. It is, we were killed in our country, you know, so, uh, or we were attacked in our country. So it was very, uh, very clear that the, as far as the histories of people are concerned, they don't sort of start at one point, terminate, and then, you know, start again. There is, there is a continuity in the way in which people experience and think about history. And so the oral history part of it was quite important. Now, uh, as we expanded the idea of the archive, when you moved away from uh, the National Archives of India and whatever it is, it was clear that one of the things that we, we needed to do was to actually talk to people um, who, it was already by that time 70 years since the uh, sense of partition. So everybody, uh, people were dying and they were, they were close, I mean, they were dying without telling their stories. A uh, number of people have written about the way in which partition survivors did not actually speak about the partition from, for many, many years later, uh, till many, many years later. So it was like a wound that they carried and they did, and they thought, let's get on with the business, business of living, and they didn't really go at that. But with them would go the stories, with them would go the human experience of actually what happened at the time of partition. And so I began to um, uh, feel that we needed to uh, collect these stories. and. Um, Shrikant, who had helped, my son-in-law, who, who had helped with the archiving in the formal archive, uh, actually also did a lot of the work <coughs> in collecting the narratives. He actually got onto his motorcycle and got to various places and collected some very interesting uh, material too. He, uh, it was clear that, the, um, that each of these stories, each of these accounts, uh, was an account not only of the social networks, you know, where they went, all of which has been very nicely done in the book, in, uh, in that collective thing which Tarun Khanna and all have uh, written. Uh, but also there was the individuated story. And the individual story literally was unique in every case. They, it could not be replicated because human experience is like that. It is actually unique. It is not my experience can't be hers and can't be hers. You know, it, it is different. Uh, but it is also very rich in terms of what actually happens to you uh, at that moment. So uh, I started to uh, do some interviews. I haven't, I didn't do that many, but I did about 20, 25, and they were very rich in terms of the. Now all of the these people whom I interviewed, who were now in their seventies, eighties, one of them has, a couple of them have actually passed on, um, were children, children or young adults at the time when one started to interview them. And that meant that they... Now, so what I'm going to say briefly, because I don't, there isn't that much time. Um, um, so one of the things that's significant in the narrating itself, I will get to the detail later on, but uh, what sense do the uh, protagonists, the experiences of the partition, as they tell their account so many years later, what kind of, uh, you know, re recall do they have? How do they recall the partition and the way in which it happened? It was. It would be very uh, interesting to see the dis differences in the way in which people actually told the stories. So, in a sense, it became a question of if you were, uh, if you were, a, say, for instance, a professor, uh, sociology. One of my interviewees is. Uh, uh, was a professor of sociology, very interesting man, who um, was 13 at the time the partition happened. And I always saw him as someone who was extremely uh, hostile to questions of gender. Uh, and I would, I, we had a running uh, rela relationship. And this is, a, a, in the, you, uh, for your information, this is JPS Oberoi. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I had this running uh, battle with him over questions of women. Um, he told the most incredible story because he actually tells it, and I can't go into the details of everybody, but reflecting back from his understanding, he's a sociologist, he's made, he was very interested in Islam. He did his field work, in fact, in, uh, and he was 13 when he, they came across. Um, he did his field work in Afghanistan afterwards, you know. So he, he actually carried the partition and his experience of being in Lahore uh, 
to in, in an interesting way into the kind of work that he did in the future. Now, what was interesting about him was that he not only had the eye for the details, so he told you, you know, what kind of land was uh, compensated, what was not compensated, those details he had very finely. Evacuate what property is different from refugee property. You know, all sorts of little nuances that would be provided. But most interestingly, uh, his whole account, uh, and first I'll tell you this very charming detail, the 60-40, everybody knows that there was a 60-40 division between the, including the cutlery and whatever it was. It's made a joke of now. You know, that is, even the museum holdings uh, are divided on a 60-40 basis, which means that the Harappan material uh, is divided like that. And so we got the dancing girl, but they got the uh, priest. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was this division of even that. <laughs> that detail they were. So here's the 60-40 division happening, and suddenly they discover they don't have, the Amritsar Hospital does not have radium. So somebody goes around to, uh, to Nehru and says, we don't have any radium, it's all in Lahore. He writes a handwritten note and gives it to this doctor, who carries it and goes to Lahore, and brings back 60% 6, of the radium in a lead box, and delivers it to uh, the Amritsar Hospital, and that's how the 60-40 division. Now, you know, so it's cutlery, but it's also this. Let's remember, uh, it's, history is not only about trivia. History is actually about a lot of uh, detail. Anyway, uh, so even this comes out of uh, uh, Professor Oberoi's account. But what was most amazing was that he told the history of the partition as a, he said, uh, what sense does he make of this division? He said, this is what patriarchs do. They divide the land. They divide the assets. And they make shares. And they say, this is yours, this is yours. You know? And that's what they were doing. So he actually saw it as, and this man, whom I thought was the most patriarchal person in my life, suddenly now makes a, a you know, statement which I completely vibe with because it's absolutely true. This is what patriarchs do. They just divide up things in, in that whatever it is. But he was, his own story is quite amazing because his family starts to fall apart because of the domestic dynamics of patriarchy within. So he's got a father who's trying to abandon his mother. And he's using the partition to try and abandon her. Now the son is 13 and knows something is happening over here. And so, uh, you know, there's this whole drama being enacted of, uh, I need to go and retrieve my books. Uh, and his wife says, oh, oh, you do? I also want to come along. <laughs> and he's, she knows he's trying to dump her. So she goes, and then these two kids are left, the son and the daughter. 13-year-old son and the, uh, and the 10-year-old daughter are left on the station. And the daughter bursts into tears. And she says, this is the last we are going to see of him. They will never come back, you know? And she's crying. And, uh, and she says, I will have to, and the detail is interesting. I will have to manjo find Pandey at, at, in the houses of people. That means I have to wash utensils in the houses of the well-off people because I'll have nothing. And he consoles her and he says, no, no, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. We have English education. So English education will serve us well. And don't worry that nothing is going to happen to you. So look at the recall and the dynamics that is being enacted at that moment uh, over there. But anyway, so it's, uh, it's uh, the story, the, the manner in which you tell the story has to do a lot with the kind of person you become. But you are casting your own memory of the detail of what happened at that stage through the eyes and the, the lens of you as the adult who's now looking back with the politics and with the understanding and the sociology or whatever it is of the past. Now, from that point of view, actually the uh, narratives both have a structure, but they are also um, quirky. You know, uh, there, there's a quirky element uh, of uh, uh, what they, uh, they tell you. And again, I, um, I think I have five minutes maybe? Or maybe. Three or four. <laughs> three, four. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll try and get it in three or four. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that actually nobody knew what was going to happen. Really, nobody had knew that they would that there was going to be this amazing distant, uh, fleeing of the population. That's not something that they and 
initially people who were given the choice of being in different you know choose to be in india or in pakistan including the army chose to be in uh, say uh, six might choose to be in pakistan and the argument that was used was very interesting uh, choose the father says to the son who is a 21 year old um, army man uh, choose pakistan because our lands are there and then he has a line which is most interesting he said uh um <laughs> i'm trying to recover the precise uh words uh ha it's the more you read it <laughs> somebody has read the, read the book oh there she can't sitting over there yeah so he he says uh he says um we have lived before under mughal rule we can live again so it was not as if to say because because this was a, a um, you were now going to live in, in under the statehood or under the uh, community which is and yet then because the violence happened then you know within 20 days then you also re choose your uh, your uh, whatever it's uh, 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 since we don't have time i will just um, yeah, but the similar kind of statement would be said but why should we go why should we go raj badalta hai awam nahi badalti hai so power the the government changes why should you know nothing and equally there's this you know an interesting woman whose daughter is studying for the exam there's a lot of concern about her safety and whatever it is security but she's studying for her exams people are trying to do the normal also and she the mother comes and says what are you studying and she says i'm uh, i'm reading uh, uh, english literature she says this is not the time to read english literature history padho look at what happens when state power changes this is the widowed mother telling her daughter this is what is important state power will uh, is all the difference and then you know there's a storyline of how she uh, she transforms her her um, uh, history as it were i mean she takes uh, she shows agency and i i will quickly tell you only two two literally a line each um there's um, uh, a a long account that was given by uh, uh two brothers I, actually uh, the brother gave us the account it's a long account of how they go from narobar to wherever they can't get into india because the uh, jammu and kashmir maharaja says you can't come into this place you go from some other route and so on and finally they they make it to india um but on the way uh, and there's a see a saga that he tells his younger brother is sitting over there and the younger brother's only memory he's 4 years old he was 4 at the time of the partition so his only memory is that he insisted on wearing his new shirt as he goes along and he had walnuts akrot the uske so he's carrying the akrot he insists on carrying the akrot across the the migration the, the long migration is something that is and he won't he's clutching it and at the river uh which they have to cross to come to to this side he drops an akrot and he sets up a howl and he refuses to budge from there till the uh, akrot is retrieved the father of the thing in desperation goes off in the direction of where it's floated around and it's a bunch of rushes and he goes up to there uh, and he finds a man standing hiding in the rushes with a knife so it's a critical moment i mean could, there could be an assault over there but he doesn't do anything this man retrieves the akrot he brings it back and gives it to his son and his son carries the akrot across to india and that's the story that's the only incident he remembers of the partition okay now <laughs> from there only cut to one story which is not my own personal story so this is from anish kidwai who has a chapter who actually has a chapter on children so my so my chapter is really about children at that point of time so she has this wonderful account of children in the camp there's this little girl who has been found in the hospital uh and the nurse saying deal with her because she's going to create a riot over here uh and what do they discover what's your name she says sita hasina <laughs> uh what's your father's name similar one hindu one muslim name what's your mother's name one hindu one muslim name 
they, they don't know what to do with her because they can't find out her identity and she's stuck sticking with this thing. So then they rush off, she takes, she's taken to Ga because Anishkit Bhai was very beholden to, uh, uh, to Gandhiji for everything, she's taken to Gandhiji. He asks the question, she says the same thing, Sita Hasina. Then what do you do with the Sita Hasina because na and nobody has come to claim her. She finally goes to the Kasturba uh, school for orphans. And that's the last we hear of her. So we don't know what happened to her. But intuitively, she decided identities is the problem. And so let's, uh, let, me, let me just end the identities. And that's my way of dealing with it. So in a sense, the child, as the witness of the partition, is quite an extraordinary story to reveal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, all three of you. I was the beginning a tabulation of all the fascinating things that I learned in this time, and I think there are too many for me to <laughs> count. But you know, I mean, look, you just ended with identity, and now, Shirinji, you talked about something that would be surprising to most people, which is that at that moment, which was thought to be all about identity, the identity of the Kamis was much more complicated than you might imagine. Mm. Uh, and of course, interestingly, all the uh, socialist governments uh, of the many, many decades that followed also continued to fail them uh, in the intervening uh, d decades also. You know, Jennifer, I just want to underscore the, the couple of things that you said. And then, you know, we could have, I, I have a bunch of questions, but I'd really love to hear from the audience. But I just, you know, it's worth underscoring that when you, in your research, you found 18 million people had crossed, and that's just the Punjab border, that's just the Western border. You know, the book also has a chapter on what happened on the Eastern side. 18 million people, it's the largest forced migration, I, Jennifer said it, but it's worth saying again, in recorded human history. Uh, you know, when you think of how staggering that is, and sometimes people like to say, you know, uh, 18 million out of 400 million, but it wasn't really. It was 18 million out of a very small portion of uh, northern British India, really. Of course, some people moved from Bihar, UP, other places, but mostly it was Punjab, what are present day Punjab, Haryana, uh, and parts of UP, uh, and 3 million dead. Uh, you know, we may not have time to get into it, but there's another part that Jennifer found, which is that these young nations that didn't even know their borders at some points, uh, and some would argue, since we're still negotiating them, that we don't know them to this day, um, you know, actually in the end met the challenge with their limited resources, the humanitarian challenge, in ways that are extraordinary. So, you know, we created the worst of situations. I talk about the collective we, all of us in this subcontinent, and we also met it with extraordinary humanity and administrative competence, which will surprise you, but that's also there. Um, but, you know, uh, but before I go on and ask about those things, I'd love to hear from the audience questions, thoughts, comments, because as I said, this is something that touches all of us. Uh, almost all of us have some direct connection, family, friend to these events uh, and an academic interest in them. Would you yes, identify yourself also? Yeah, this is Dr. Sarvjit Dodeja. Uh, I have a very hypothetical or futuristic question. The way present day government is talking about a partition was based on religion, then it was for Hindus and that was for Muslim. So why not to exodus this Muslim forever? So it should be only for Hindu. Is it possible? To happen in future? Well, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Would you restate your question, sir? I'm, sorry. I'm saying. Would you, would you, yeah, just move yeah. the microphone closer to you. Yeah, you. the present day government is yeah. very adamant about this partition was happened on religion based. Yes. India is for Hindu and Pakistan is for Muslim. Yes. So why Muslims should be allowed to stay back here? Why not should be compelled to leave this country to Pakistan? Is it going to happen? Oh, you're afraid it might happen again. Um, and that there might be, well, I'll let our panelists speak, but there's no doubt that the 
memory and the facts and the experience of partition continue to haunt our, our politics and our culture throughout the subcontinent, not just here. Uh, did one of you want to speak about that? I think it's, uh, I mean, some of the things which Uma said, which I said about um, how partition actually, how people experienced it, both Hindus and Muslims, and I looked at Muslims, low caste. Um, and we can see that it was not based on, it was not um, the that Muslims were going to be sent somewhere. Uh, there was a choice which was made. There was also, this was not the, Indian constitution and the promise of a secular India you know, over which um, the, how this republic was shaped. So I don't think this uh, question actually, it's a dangerous question, I would say. Um, these are people, Muslim people, this is very much their home. They were born here, they, they live here. This is their country. And those who are saying that they should be sent um, somewhere, um, it, it, it's actually unconstitutional to tell, say that your uh, citizens can be sent somewhere else. Um, and it should not be the, we've come to this um, state, in fact, I, I don't even know how to, um, uh, when such a question is asked about people who chose to be here, and we saw that thing uh, very well articulated by women of Shaheen Bagh when they were sitting um, on the protest against the Citizenship Amendment Act when they said um, that this is the country they were born into, this was the country of their choice, and they, they chose to be in India because there was a promise of a secular India, and this was the making of the republic. And if that republic is going back to that promise, that's very unfortunate, and many of us will fight um, till the end to save that uh, no, promise. Even Hindus and Sikhs were not willing to leave that country, Pakistan. They were compelled to leave. Yes. Uh, Je Jennifer, you also have a thought about this. Yes, uh, as you all know, I am not from the subcontinent. And uh, every country has a very painful, vicious history. Every country. Uh, every country on earth. And the ones that are large and diverse, diverse in terms of people, uh, have struggled to have constitutional ways of taking care of each of these populations in ways that are respectful, um, or have failed to have constitutional protections upheld, have been undermined by anger and rival groups, um, these days by distortions of the media to an extreme degree, which were not available um, to any actor at the time of partition. Um, there were screeds and there were vernacular newspapers which actually played a big role in whipping up sentiment. But uh, these days, um, there is enough understanding of the horrors of civil war or mass violence in highly populated countries that have traditions and norms and have struggled very hard to be where they are, that the United Nations has made it an absolute violation of the charter for one country to invade another or to, from outside, attempt to overturn it. It is the most primitive standing of the international community and most enduring because it is what allows us over time to go forward together. So, uh, sir, I would um, respect your right to ask the question um, respect our response. And I think we need to move on to other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I'm interested in your also answering. Yeah, sure. Oh, let me go to Shristi first, and Professor, I'll come to you next. Uh, please. Thank you, uh, Hitesh. Uh, and thank you for the 
the very, very uh, brilliant uh, perspective, all three discussions. And, uh, you know, what struck me throughout was the strong sense of belonging, uh, you know, that, that most of the communities and, and groups of people that were referred to. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, you could comment on nostalgia a little bit um, and the sense of uh, belonging towards an unpartitioned land which still remains with us as recently as 2015, 16. Um, and, and this is also an experience from my own fieldwork at the borderland, um, you know, members of the, uh, the tribal community that reside. So whether it's a good tool to reflect on some of these issues uh, or a concept that we could at least dwell on, um, I'd love your um, comment on that, please. Yes, I was thinking, Ubaji. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'll try and take it on. Um, among, of course, nostalgia is actually shared across the board uh, on both sides, okay? And uh, uh, because I've also crossed borders and I've talked to people in Pakistan, and there is an incredible amount of nostalgia. And if you read um, uh, Wazira Zamindar's The Long Partition, she's actually dealing a lot with uh, both community, I mean, uh, people in India as well as in Pakistan. Uh, but one of the places where it's been very well captured already in, in uh, nostalgia uh, is actually in documentary cinema. Um, so recently, uh, for, with, along with a young filmmaker of mine, I have not made a film on partition, but she has, and we curated a film festival, a three-day film, uh, three-day film festival uh, at the Habitat, and you you actually see the nostalgia and the loss uh, played out. Uh, amazingly in uh, in this. Uh, um, so there is a lot of nostalgia and people, you know, they have it exist as long as you have memory. You have actually the presence of that place still inside you. And if you've lived there at any point of time and brought it, it may be, you know, uh, it may be 70 years, 75 years later, but you're still carrying uh, so much of it in, in the form of, you know, um, the food, who came around, what they said, uh, what kind of uh, um, relationships you had. Uh, apart from the moment of crisis, the long-term relationship that happened uh, was, was part of their history. Uh, I think, so in that, in that sense, the nostalgia remains for the place. And I get uh, messages from people, so recently there was this um, uh, and you get it from both sides. You see, you see, you see uh, recently an 88-year-old woman crossed the border, went across, and she made history. You know, I mean, like, well, she was given the visa, she went across, and she went. And I know of a, a story which was uh, related to me when I was sitting in the Pakistan, uh, and I was waiting for my visa. Uh, this man told me the story of a Sardar who came to the, an old Sardar with his son. They came for a visa. And he just told that, you know, that visa giver, uh, that is the, con the, the officer giving, stamping the visas. He said, I am I mean, what will you do to me, huh? I, I'm going, I, I'm going. He got the visa. And the story is amazing because he got the visa. He went to Rawalpindi, which is where he was from. Uh, he went to his old house and he asked for a charpai. And he lay down on the charpai and he died. That's the story that uh, the, the, this uh, visa giver is telling me about this man. So nostalgia is something that um, has, is carried really on both sides. It's quite amazing what they were. And I recently have been given a message, uh, uh, sent a message which says, this man is longing to go and see his birthplace. Please do, please get, get, get him a visa now, you know. <laughs> You know, so I want to go to the professor, but let me abuse my uh, uh, privilege as a moderator to also say, you know, your question, of course, raises very painful possibilities. They're dreams and nightmares, and we have both of them. But, you know, there's a kind of confidence we can also have in the history of this subcontinent. You know, I think back to the fact that when, when Alexander's armies crossed into India, uh, and they and we have this in recorded history. They spoke to the Gymnosophoi, the naked Indian philosophers, about what land this was, uh, which they didn't know about and had only heard of, of it as a mythological place from Herodotus. Um, 
the people who described it described it from where they were to the mouth of the Ganges, to the mouth of the Sindhu River, to Kanyakumari, and they knew the dimensions. It was clear that already in 300 BC, 323 or something, people thought of this as a cultural unit. And of course, they knew there were kingdoms that fought brutal wars with each other, <laughs> and they were divided. And you know, you spoke earlier uh, about the division of the museum artifacts. We got the dancing girl from the Indus Valley, and Pakistan got the priest. If you look at the dancing girl and the priest, they also represent two different, what in the 19th century would have been called racial types. As early as the Indus Valley, there were people here who clearly came from Africa, and there were people here who clearly came from Western Asia. So there is a way in which the long history of this place, which has always been divided politically, you know, is with us. And that's why I always think, you know, Khalid, uh, one of the great poets of all time, uh, he wrote a verse that he never wrote, in the sense that there's a verse that's been put into his divan, which scholars will tell you doesn't belong there, but most of us have heard it. Uh, for those who don't know Urdu, he's saying to the priest, for God's sake, priest, don't remove the, cur the curtain from the Kaaba, lest it be that there too I see the face of my infidel beloved. So of course, instead of seeing God's presence, he's seeing his beloved, classic Urdu. And instead of just any beloved, she's a kafir, or he's a kafir since it's technically male. And it's not just speaking to the Muslim who's at the Kaaba, it's speaking to all of us, because speaking as a kafir, you know, I might be that infidel beloved, you know, uh, we're all somehow intertwined. So one can have a certain a nightmare and a certain kind of confidence in the resilience of the place also. And we see both of those working out in history. I'm sorry, I've now talked long enough, but please. Yeah, so uh, Uma, I just uh, thought when you were saying that patriarchs divide things and that's the sociologist uh, uh, JPS Oberoi's insight, that you know, we all see things through our own lenses. And G.D. Bedla is a business family. He said, if you have a family quarrel, you, a joint family splits. Yeah. So this was his way of saying that partition should, uh, should occur. It's a quarrel in a joint family, so you, so you divide. But I was very struck by when you said that after 84, the uh, people said, Ki yaha nahi hua, waha nahi hua, yaha hua, that we were killed here. And this is what a Sikh said. And I wonder how that squares with this statistic of three million. You know, because the, the thing is, it's, the previous estimates were much lower. I think J.D. Khosla was five lakhs, five, 500,000. Penderil Moon, I think, was maybe 200,000. I'm not, I don't remember exactly. I think it was 200,000. Now, there's such a difference. How, so my question is this, that can we reflect on how did people get things so wrong? If something of this magnitude was going on around them, you know, our normal sense is that people exaggerate what is happening around them. Here there seems to be a kind of deflation, yeah. which, which mystifies me and I, I would a, like you to reflect on that. It's a great question and it's something Jennifer has been thinking about. I mean, it is the question that um, I didn't address. That is, we found statistically by numbers that there were three million people missing. The question is, why was the death rate so high? And it's part of a longer essay or book that I want to write. It lies ahead. Um, but what I understand, um, and it's coming out, in the archives of various um, police and other security forces on both sides of the border now in the Punjab. Very difficult because they're under very tight control. But there are, are historians who are working on this, certainly not 
I, but um, the reason I have a hunch that what is coming out is going to be accurate and that the 300,000 is accurate is that um, mm -hmm. I've seen how people get killed in other instances of forced migration. And the jeopardy comes when you are a, in a small group and you are away from authorities and you're behind a hill or on the other side of a river and you um, are then trapped by marauders from the other side. There was a great deal of killing that happened in Darfur, um, which was the westernmost province of Sudan. And there was um, violence between um, Africans who lived in Darfur who basically looked into the rest of Africa and their native languages were African languages. They were Muslim and they were as dark as the Sudanese who were speaking Arabic and they looked actually towards um, the capital um, and were affiliated with Khartoum. And there were big fights over land and some were cattle um, rangers and camels and others were farmers and grew things. So there were divides in how they lived, but they lived in the same land. And what was agitated um, was that there were government forces that were favoring one side or the other. Um, and so it's a complex issue of ecology and conflict for resources in a drought affected area, already climate change had hit them, and antagonisms that were whipped up around um, not color, um, and not really clearly around religion, but around language. And they each knew who the other was. And the killings were immense, and the reason people got killed was that small groups of uh, Janjaweed who were on horses or in Toyota trucks would attack the villages at dawn, and they would basically kill everybody that they could find. and the women began to hear this and they stayed back and, because they knew they could slow these guys down by getting raped. And so the story in these parts of Darfur that reached Chad, which is where I was doing the interviewing, as a human rights person, I could not get a visa to go into Sudan proper. I interviewed people when they just got across the border. And the story is that as these patterns in the war went on for quite a while, um, the men fled and the women stayed and it gave a chance for the men to flee across a desert that had very few trees. And so the point here that I'm getting back at is that my very strong hunch, and it's being underscored by what I'm hearing people who know the archives are saying, the secret archives, is that there were um, intense small groups of um, a, very, very enraged um, extremists who were killing people in the villages, way in the countryside, killing them unknown to the British, far from any force that was large enough for their side to protect them. And the killings went on unabashed, uncounted, and unrestrained. And that way I know from some of these, from small places like Kosovo to much larger places like Darfur, you can kill a whole lot of people. The UN stopped counting in Syria when it hit 500,000 because they just couldn't keep track of all the data that was coming in and they couldn't rely on what it was. Uh, the UN um, determined that 500,000 people had been killed in Darfur because they didn't want to count any higher because it was going to be so explosive, really. They stopped counting and the killing was still going on. So it's not that this order of magnitude is um, in, incredible. It's not that. It's that we have not yet got the full story. And we may never get the full story. But the trend would suggest that there were many people killed who never surfaced as numbers that were recorded. Basically, it's killing off stage in a way. It's killing off stage, off, off the eyes of the elite or the British or the judges yeah. 
who made the estimates. The yes, who made and, the and, estimates. The, and the family members who came and have their stories and spoke speak of having somebody killed on the train or two or three people picked off when they were staying by the side of the road at night, which is always a dangerous thing along the Grand Front. They would be, they would know who was killed. Hmm? And the British knew who was slaughtered on the trains because they were there. And the various members of the military evacuation organization, whether they were Pakistani or Indian military, just knew Pakistani military. Hmm? Um, they worked together to try to stop the killings, but they were focused on the huge numbers that were moving. I mean, it was like a river, right, coming. And there were some people coming through the brush and people flying and wealthy people on boats, et cetera. But they were focused on this mass of people moving. But on the other side, over the hill, so to speak, if you think of a cowboy moving in America, there is stuff happening. And that, I think, is what is really turning out to be the new findings. And these will not be findings that I can personally attest to. It's going to be more data coming out uh, because there are intrepid investigators on both sides of the border. And it's not for a political reason that they are trying to get these answers. It really isn't. It's for them to try to understand what actually happened during partition because the, the, the agony that has not been discussed is a large contributor to the loss of life but there's enough known about how people died or were killed that is still feeding into anger. And uh, it's, it's, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a hazardous inquiry. Um, and it's not one that I can undertake, but it's one that I think is based on very sound premises. Hey, thank you. Uh, we are... Uh, sure. Because in, then I think we shall have to end after that. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people also died. Oh. Please say who you are. Sir. Uh, uh, I'm, my name is Srikant. I uh, helped in uh, uh, archiving, uh, finding uh, archival material for the project. <coughs> A lot of people also have died of uh, epidemics. Yes. And uh, we need to remember that uh, the Second World War caused a massive rise in food prices. Uh, and especially in Punjab, there was a situation close to famine, famine if not actual famine. In Bengal, we had a famine. Yes. In Punjab, because of the rise in the cost of food prices, there was a situation close to famine. And people were underfed. And we have seen, we have many photographs of children, you know, just dying uh, of cholera and other diseases. As, even when they are being administered medical help, there are various photographs or evidences. And we can just imagine if there's such a large exchange of population of all, uh, almost uh, 20 million, a 10, 15% death is not unimaginable. And also the, uh, 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 the large number of migrants, see the trains and the transport, the lorries, they could carry only the 10, at the most 8 to 10 percent of the population, who, but the large number of population had cattle, the bulla carts, and uh, the whole uh, other things. They had to travel, seven, they had to march 500 miles, say 800 kilometers, right from Mewat all the way to uh, across the Rajasthan border. In, uh, so mar just marching that distance, a lot of people just died in marching for that distance. So we have to, uh, when we study history, the thing is, uh, history has, as a discipline, we take into uh, account only the objective aspect, that the material that is presented to us. But there are a lot of the subjects, the subjective factor, which just, which is because of its non-material nature, it just, it is just not there when the epoch has passed. So, so, so these kind of uh, uh, things which have been reported in human people's experiences. Um, uh, Trika, could I just say, you're bringing up a really brilliant point. And it was uh, part of my answer, and I forgot it. Uh, because you, and you, you found those archives. You find those records. And just from a more public health standpoint, getting back to your question, um, indeed, there were large numbers of people who died uncounted from illnesses and distress and dehydration and waste and people along the way who lost maybe two children. There was nobody at a census that was saying, here you are a family, how many people have you lost? Nobody was doing that accounting. So the other um, contributor to deaths, and I don't know, um, you're implying and you may well be right, 
that the larger share is from just the agony and attrition that comes from this kind of forced exodus. Um, and there are some killing in the countryside, a dimension that I will never be able to understand, okay? And maybe somebody will come later to find the records. But, but Shrikant, your point is really well taken. And I'm so glad you raised it because it's, it's, it's very important that people understand this as a major factor. So I think um, all of this underscores how vast an experience and how traumatic it was. Um, I don't think we have, do we have time or should we end now? I'm looking to Namita who, <laughs> do you have a quick question Vidya? I know you've been waiting, no. no it's absolutely all right, I understand the time. It's a little woolly headed anyways. I'm yes. okay to <laughs> Yes, please, uh, say your name so everyone uh, on the internet. I'm Abhishek Sharma, I'm practicing law in Delhi. Uh, my question to you is, uh, I want to understand your comment on the fact, what is the effect of the recipient population of these migrants? You mean where they're coming, right? Yes. How, they're, how yes. well they're received, so, yes. yes. So, um, the communities who, who... Could you expand it a little more or somebody else? The communities I think, I think where they I'm land. I'm asking that uh, how does the receiving population deal yes. with the uh, influx In of the, the arms? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, um, I know, and there's a chapter in our book that is talking about the changes in the cities um, with the new populations coming in. So Lahore, Karachi, um, Delhi, and Bombay. And, uh, and these analyses of the housing arrangements give a lot of very interesting um, examples of how there was quite enormous accommodation. It took, however, between 10 and 20 years further in these cities to find their balance, enough sensible housing for people. There were people who stayed in, in large camps and tent settlements. I mean, the Nagaras here outside of Delhi are where refugees first settled and then they moved into more settled areas afterwards. So there's a, there is a reception and people were taken care of. And then they were moved into various places where they might have stayed in sort of transitory things, tents even in Bombay for a while. 10 years in tents, um, before they could find other housing. I mean, army barracks from World War II were filled up in all of these cities, and, and the crowds coming in overwhelmed those numbers that were possibly going to be housed. So the, the civil society and government on both sides worked incredibly hard to find housing and livelihoods for these people that arrived. Jenna did a really wonderful thing. I mean, <clears throat> it was a tough decision, but all of the refugees <clears throat> coming, excuse me, coming from India um, who were moving into Pakistan were clustering around Lahore. But Lahore was basically like an amritsar. It was the place where everybody was coming, fleeing and crossing. And to have all these new people coming and starting to settle up tents and things, Jinnah realized that was not going to work. He, with Pakistan, <clears throat> had <coughs> excuse me, empty land, so to speak, in the south and the west. And so he had people move down there because they were farmers primarily, and that was where they could go. Um, but the other issue, and this gets back to the, um, the, the point that uh, Shrikant's making, is that there was enormous civil society surge in trying to help people who were coming in. And Delhi has an extremely important history there, the Delhi government. Um, and they, the women's societies that clustered around the um, government executive committee for the, um, the treatment of the refugees that was set up. There were similar committees that were set up under both, um, both governments. Women's civil society went into full force in terms of supporting the doctors, the nurses, the hospitals, and uh, it helped the women who then, of course, could care for the children in terms of nutrition and teaching and health care and it was these women's groups around Delhi that actually raised the issue of the abducted women. Um, and there have been several very good books on this and papers over the last um, 25 years. So that the, the, the amount of help that became available to people on both sides, once they survived to get there, being depleted by the, the epidemics and the killings, um, it was full throttle um, attention of both governments for the first five years of their existence. 
to take care of the received refugee population. It was, it was truly, if we want to talk about the good side of this, that, that these governments did everything possible they could do. Um, they didn't have paper, they didn't have tele telephones, Jenna barely had a typewriter. I mean, it was, it was um, an extraordinarily sparse time for government, particularly on the Pakistan side. And the, the effort to take care of these new arrivals was, um, in my view, um, heroic and has not been lauded enough, has not been praised enough. Uh, so this is the longer book I want to write about the public health response and the civil society response to, and the government in its humanitarian mode um, uh, as a result of partition. So th this book has fascinating and sometimes grim accounts. Um, and uh, it gives a panoply of insights that carry up to the present. Um, there's, there are other books that people are going to be writing and other stories to tell. But your, your question's excellent, and thank you for asking it. Jennifer, thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. I just wanted to add, you know, you mentioned Delhi, the women's, as the book rec, uh, records, the women's societies in Bengal, you know, also really stepped up uh, in the crisis there, which was a different sort of crisis. We haven't talked enough about that, but uh, there will be more books than other occasions. I want to thank all of you for participating and for being in a conversation with us. And I especially want to thank all of our uh, panelists, Jennifer Leaning, uh, Navsharanji, Umaji, thank you very much for giving us multiple perspectives into our own history. Uh, thank you all very much. I, uh, are there still chai and uh, snacks outside? I don't think it's no. meant to precede. <laughs> it was meant to precede. I want to also thank the Mittal Institute's team, and I also want to thank our partners at Harvard Business School, IRC from Mumbai, who've been helping us put all these together. Everyone's worked very hard. Thank you so much. Thank you.